Okay, and um, kindly give us your thoughts. I mean, what have I got to do? Oh, somebody's recorded it already. That's okay. Okay, great. Istvan, go ahead. Well, thanks again for the invitation. Uh, it's a very exciting story, the, the relationship between uh, the European People's Party and, uh, and Fidesz. And, uh, well, I, I have some points, uh, and uh, I try to be short and uh, give some much more floor to for discussion and debates. Uh, so, first of all, uh, is Fidesz leaving the European People's Party? Or, or uh, the EBT gets rid of Fidesz? Okay, now I think it's okay. One has to do it himself or herself. Okay, thank you. So who left whom? That's the first question. And I think it, it does not really matter historically. Uh, what happened yesterday was just the last drop in the glass. And, uh, well, somebody should mute himself or herself. Otherwise, it's very... Yeah, confusing. sorry, could, could you turn off your... Um, camera, please, Des, because it, it's affected the recording and suddenly it's got worse. So if all, we could keep our cameras off and mute our microphones, please. Okay. No, hopefully it works now. Thank you. Uh, so who left whom? Uh, I would argue, first of all, that it doesn't matter historically. It's uh, just uh, what happened yesterday was the last drop in the glass. And it was seemingly a bureaucratic decision, a debate on the rules and procedures, but it's not so important. Nobody will remember it in a couple of weeks, uh, what happened uh, yesterday, because it's a long process. And for me, it was not a surprise at all. It was uh, the very end of a long end game. The end game started let's say, two years ago, when the Sargentini report was approved by the European Parliament, and many, maybe most of the members of the EPP group in the European Parliament actually voted in favour of the Sargentini report, which condemned uh, the Hungarian government, not Hungary, but the Hungarian government, for its uh, behaviour in the last uh, almost 10 years back then. So. It, it's evident that the tension between the mainstream parties inside the EPP and Fidesz was already on a very high level, on a high degree, just a couple of years ago. And the end game uh, took two years since Fidesz actually was already suspended when we last met two years ago, uh, was suspended from the party. Now it's out of the political group. I think most of you know the difference, but this is more important actually that uh, Fidesz left or Fidesz was kicked out from the political group, which is much more salient because these are the uh, members of the European Parliament who formed the EPP group. And this is in, uh, in the political scene, a much more important uh, political entity then the sort of European Federation of uh, center-right parties, the European People's Party, which is not an ex such an active player in everyday uh, politics. It's certainly an important body, and I'm sure that Fidesz will be kicked out, will be expelled, or Fidesz will leave. Again, it would not matter how it happens in a, in a very few time frame from the party uh, as well. So it's not important who left whom. Maybe it's important in, in uh, domestic politics. So Fidesz always has to win. It, it, uh, it will be never defeated. So for the Hungarian uh, fanatic Fidesz, Orban supporters, it's again a victory that they left uh, the EPP, but uh, otherwise it, uh, it doesn't matter at all. Uh, my second point is, uh, is it a defeat for Orban, uh, what happened uh, yesterday and as the outcome of a longer process? Yes, of course, uh, Orban's uh, dual strategy became a total failure. The dual strategy means that he wanted to have, uh, for a long period, two irons in the fire. 
and it did not work out in, in the long run. He wanted to be a strong man inside the European People's Party, and uh, he wanted to be friended with uh, the uh, populist extremist political uh, actors at European level, like Salvini and others. And he played a game, a gamble, to do both at the same time, and it did not work out. Uh, and I think it happened mostly because he had an ideological mission zeal, which brought him close to the uh, populists, sometimes extremists. And he seemed to be uh, a pragmatic uh, on the surface. And this uh, conflict between mission zeal and pragmatism, which I think also exists in his own head, actually, uh, at the end uh, conflicted each other and there was no more uh, compromise. He tried to be uh, uh, ready for compromise for a while in the last couple of years uh, regarding the wishes of the EPP leadership, the EPP bureau, and so on. But he was not able to show enough flexibility because of his own political and ideological views. He cannot, he could not, and cannot step back uh, as uh, much as uh, he was asked for. Just remember the CEU or many other issues where the EPP had a long story of conflicts with uh, with Orban. Now, actually, he is humiliated again. Uh, and I think that uh, he has new enemies and might uh, think about uh, revenge uh, sooner or later. So it's definitely a defeat for Orban's uh, original strategy. It's over, it's finished, it, it cannot be restarted at all. My next point is, uh, so who won? Did the EPP win or does this question have any real sense at all? Well, I think if the EPP did not win, uh, what happened was that its uh, previous strategy, if we are, if we can call it a strategy at all, I'm not so sure, but maybe the idea of the mainstream EPP parties and the leadership was to give a sort of protecting umbrella against uh, external charges uh, towards uh, Fidesz and Orban, and to keep him inside its ranks and uh, files, uh, but on the other hand, to influence him in order to moderate him, to mitigate his uh, political ideas and uh, anti-liberal views. And it's a long story again, what happened in the last 10 years, but now it's evident that it became a failure at the end. The EPP was not able to mitigate, to domesticate Orban and Fidesz. And he, as he himself said once, uh, he did not behave properly at all. So this is not a victory for the EPP. However, it's a victory for the moderates inside the EPP who argued for a long period that this strategy of the EPP is not working. And, uh, and I think it was a long process for many to understand the essence of Orbanism and that the Orban's views are not uh, acceptable for the mainstream EPP uh, party. So EPP finally was able to, to show it the limits uh, of where populism and nationalism starts and these views are not acceptable inside the EPP. So in that sense, it's a victory for those EPP member parties and politicians who insist on the original values of the center-right, uh, conservatism and Christian democracy inside uh, the European political sphere and at uh, European level. Uh, it's a long story. I think I talked about it two years ago, why the EPP was so hesitant to turn against uh, Orban so clearly as now it happened. Uh, but uh, we can get back what was the strategy for many years and how it actually failed. But since the Sargentini report two years ago, two, three years ago, uh, it became more and more evident that even for the EPP member parties and politicians that uh, Orban does not belong to them and there should be a breakup, a rupture, uh, between the two uh, 
uh, uh, sooner or later. From outside, it was evident for many, many years. There was a huge pressure on the EPP uh, from the international media, from other mainstream also competitive parties, but anyway, it was evident for liberals, for, for the social democrats, for the Greens, that Fidesz does not belong to any of the mainstream political parties at European level. So, the, my next point is, uh, so what, what is now the role of Orban at EU level first? Uh, well, in contrast to what uh, Fidesz uh, tried to say, how Fidesz media portrayed Orban in the last years, he was never simply a strong man at European level, but he was an influential actor. That's true, especially during the migration crisis in 2015 and 16. And he was even more influential inside the EPP uh, for a while, where when uh, he seemed to be even a sort of alternative to at least to Angela Merkel's political line maybe not uh, as a leader of the EPP, but many supported him inside, and he was an influential troublemaker at European uh, level. Now, at the moment, he is not a strong man at all at European level, but he is still a troublemaker. So it's not completely over, but certainly his influence has uh, decreased, and actually it has already decreased in the last couple of years, uh, especially it, it was evident in December last year when he finally, and together with his Polish friends, was not able to veto the decisions on the budget and the recovery uh, fund at all. Uh, and he is still an important player in the Visegrad group at regional level. But his idea, his original idea to make a sort of counter revolution coming from the east part of the European Union, which would also influence the western traditional part of the European Union, this counter revolution does not exist. It's, it's over again and even inside the Visegrad group, it's not the mainstream idea uh, anymore. So, uh, my next point is, uh, what's next? Uh, and it's not really a new point, it's, it's really a, the continuation of my previous uh, uh, idea that uh, Orban now has self-isolated himself inside the European Union's uh, political leadership or elite or establishment, especially at party political level. Uh, but the EU is not simply uh, about party politics. Actually, it's a relatively new phenomenon, a new chapter that party politics matter so much inside the EU. These are uh, the, the member states. Again, I cannot talk if someone doesn't mute himself or herself. Your microphones. Thank you. So it's a relatively new phenomenon that parties became so important, uh, but still the EU is not only about party politics and Orban is still uh, the prime minister of Hungary and, and member states uh, matter a lot when decisions uh, are made. So Orban can have influence at European level uh, still, but uh, because of relative self-isolation, uh, uh, it will be harder for him. Now, the question is, which is certainly discussed uh, today already in the international media, whether Orban would move and Fidesz would move towards another European party organization, party family, and that's certainly possible, and, and I think he will do so. And uh, the most likely outcome of this situation will be for him to join uh, the next group, uh, ideologically, the European Conservative and Reform Group, where his uh, Polish uh, uh, allies, the, the Peace and Kaczynski's party, is there. Although we don't know whether the idea to create a sort of populist international and this group inside European 
Parliament is still on the agenda. I think it's very much on the agenda. So sooner or later, having in mind his sort of revolutionary ideas, this might be the next, uh, maybe not the next, but then the forthcoming uh, step uh, in one or two years or before the European elections to create uh, a bigger group, a more influential group, which is definitely uh, have a which will have a definite political line against the mainstream political parties, including center-right, liberals, greens, social democrats, etc. Et so that might come sooner or later. My next point is, can European Democrats be happy because of the uh, event uh, yesterday that Fidesz is out of the EPP? Yes, I think so. We should be happy. Uh, it, this decision, uh, this outcome of the events shows that uh, values matter, uh, political practices matter. It matters how far uh, a, 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 a member state government is ready to go in destructing, uh, in, uh, in uh, undermining uh, liberal democracy and uh, no uh, mainstream democratic uh, liberal minded political group can tolerate it uh, anymore. So this is an important message globally, so certainly even more at European level, but even globally, and also for those who want to access, to join the European Union, that uh, at least regarding party politics, it's not acceptable what uh, a member state uh, government has done uh, so far in recent uh, years. That's another story, how, what to do at inside the European Union in general. But at party political level, the, the message is uh, clear. There is nothing like illiberal democracy. That's, that's the message of uh, yesterday's uh, decision in my eyes. Uh, certainly it happened too late, but it's never too late. It's better to do it now than not do it any time. My next point, point is, uh, uh, is, is really something which is very close to my previous one. Is Orban's defeat the end of the story globally? Uh, well, this, this belongs to the trend, to the recent trend, when uh, populist authoritarians are losing ground uh, in the transatlantic area. I'm not talking about uh, China or, or, or Russia and Brazil and so on, but at least in the traditional West, populists uh, seem to lose uh, ground. And it's, uh, it's very important to, to, to show up the cleavage between those who support liberal democratic values and liberal democracy in, uh, in general and those who deny these values. And it's a very important fight uh, with populists for the soul of citizens, for the votes of citizens, for the European project and for liberal democracy in general. Now, my next point is about the Hungarian opposition. I think it's a very good news for the Hungarian uh, opposition at the moment. This is a chance for them, uh, they have to make good political steps and good political strategy, strategy what they need. But this is a chance to show the difference, uh, which, is, which has become even more evident in the eyes of the uh, voters, the citizens, hopefully as well. There are those who are with Europe and those, well, we might call it with the West, how we Hungarians traditionally used to talk about uh, the EU or Europe. There, is, there are those who are with Europe, with the West, and there are those who are against uh, Europe or the West. And those who are with Europe, those are with us, and who are against Europe, they are with Orban. So they, the opposition might use this cleavage uh, in its campaign, since most of the Hungarians in support EU membership of the country, they still want to get uh, the the uh, money transfers coming from the European budget and so on. So I am not sure whether this is the number one field for fight during uh, the campaign uh, 
before the elections next year. But this is an important message and part of, and it should be part of the vision of the opposition to show the difference between Orban and uh, and them. Uh, I'm sure that Orban will uh, go on with its uh, fight with its fight against uh, Brussels, how he calls it, uh, based on a national sovereignist uh, ideology. So I would not suggest uh, to the opposition to argue that Orban is not defending Hungarian interests, whatever it means to defend Hungarian interests, because that's a losing uh, play field for the uh, opposition, but it should uh, use a rhetoric which is much more about a united Europe where Hungary is part of the European uh, Union. My next point, I have only a last one, which is no, maybe not so important, but I would like to mention it uh, because in the Hungarian debate, uh, there was a lot of skepticism about uh, the European Union, not from traditional Eurosceptics, but Europhiles who, who really love the idea that Hungary has become a member state many years ago by now inside the European Union and support the European ideas. Uh, but skepticism emerged because uh, many Hungarians fear that the EU hasn't done enough and the EPP was part of this story, certainly. Now, another argument was, uh, which I did not really share, that the Germans especially uh, did not want to have a conflict with Orban and with the Hungarian government, especially because of raw economic interests. And these and German interests uh, are the interests of the German motor car industry. That was a sort of general view in Hungary. And since the German motor car industry, auto industry, seemed to be uh, satisfaction uh, by, uh, by the Hungarian economic uh, environment and their profits, the argument was that Germany would, would never speak up against Orban. Now, I think that the event yesterday showed that in politics is not only about business, even in the case of Germany. Uh, actually, the leader of the EPP group is a Bavarian guy, Manfred Weber, who now uh, made very clear statements in, in the last couple of months and year, years. He was maybe hesitant before, but I think this is more a personal uh, story, uh, how he changed his mind about Orban when he finally understood the essence of Orbanism. It's more a psychological story, what happened inside the EPP in general and with Manfred Weber in particular, but it's not only about uh, German car industry's interests. Politics is much more colorful, much more uh, creative, and uh, maybe some of you know that uh, this, this saying by the General Motors many, many years ago, 50, 60 years ago, that what is the interest of the General Motors? That's the interest of the United States. It was already by then a proclamation of the business circles, of the General Motors itself. And uh, the famous uh, French uh, political scientist Raymond R. Aaron argued against this claim that in a pluralistic society and political system, this is not the, the logic of political decisions. Should the General Motors GM cannot tell politicians what to do. It's not so simplistic. And again, I think the story with, uh, with Fidesz and the EPP and in general, Hungary's story inside the European Union is much more colorful and much more dynamic than simply using a sort of Marxist argument about the economy which, uh, which makes political decisions as well. So I am more optimistic that uh, now uh, Hungary uh, is on its real place inside the European Union, unfortunately, but which is more important that Fidesz is now with, in, uh, with its uh, real allies uh, and Orban has no other chance that to 
join up with, with the other populists and authoritarians, which is not the end of the story. Certainly, it's, there are many risks ahead of us, since this group might become much stronger. But uh, Democrats, liberals uh, should go on with, with this fight, with this conflict against populists and authoritarians. And now the picture is much more clear. Orban now belongs where he actually ideologically you've, you've muted Istvan Istvan you've muted I'm so very sorry that was um, my error I do apologize okay can you hear me now yes uh, Istvan you were you were at the point where you said that the, the story is not ended You're still muted, Van, somehow. What's happened? Uh, it's not me. Someone mutes me. You're, you're OK and now. Yeah, yeah. Well, I hope you can hear me now. It was not me. Someone played with me. It's, maybe it was Fides or I don't know who. Uh, I hope you can hear me. It's, it was just my last sentence that Democrats should uh, be ready to, to fight uh, and uh, OK, thank you. Uh, so uh, Democrats should be ready to fight uh, back, if you, we can use this uh, phrase, since it has become more evident uh, that uh, the cleavage between populists and nationalists on the one side and, uh, pop, uh, and uh, Democrats, liberals on the other, this is the number one cleavage for the future. And it's, a, it's good news for everyone that Fidesz now does not belong, even ostensibly, to the democratic liberal camp, but to the other one. So uh, it's not good for Hungary, but that's another story. Uh, we will have elections next year. And uh, now at least it's evident that Democrats at both national and European levels are on the same side. So thank you for your attention. I hope I was not too long. Um. Well, you've just about answered all the questions I had lined up, Istvan, but I'm sure we'll have a few more. Um, I think Bolaj was, uh, has raised his hand, so Bolaj, go ahead. Um, if we could identify ourselves, please. Thank you. Bolaj? Oh, we've lost him. He'll come back, I, I guess, Istvan. Um, Israel, I've got I've got one. If I, I've got one just to keep us going. Um, I I kind of agree with you that most um, Fidesz supporters will accept the line that they that they will t have taken that they've left, and you know it's a victory. But um, do you think that there'll be some who think, wait a minute, you know? Um, as uh, uh, Marton Junja she posted yesterday, that this is a step out of Europe. And even some of the Fidesz supporters, um, you know, the more the more educated ones, might they not think, well, wait a minute, has has Victor taken a step the wrong way here, not just for the party, but for Hungary? Yeah, I, I, I agree with you that uh, it it was a failure of Orban's strategy, uh, what happened uh, finally yesterday, that he, he cannot proclaim uh, that he belongs to the mainstream. And it might be a sort of wake-up call for, for some of his supporters, not the fans, not the core supporters, I think, who in 10 years actually accepted some of the anti-Brussels rhetoric, interiorized this rhetoric. But I think uh, there are still a lot, maybe traditional conservatives, who do, did not want to vote for the opposition, who might consider now their position, because the EU is an important uh, identification for, for many Hungarians. 
Europeans and the West, what I still believe is in somehow in, in our images, uh, something positive in spite of the, uh, the, the campaigns against Brussels and uh, other member states by the government. So this, this traditional orientation towards the West uh, might jeopardize uh, Orban's new position. And uh, well, it's very unlikely that uh, Hungary or Orban would put this issue on the agenda, leaving the EU uh, before the European, before the Hungarian elections the next year. But the fear of such a strategy or move, maybe not next year, but in a couple of years, uh, is actually not a totally irrational fear. So uh, uh, it might help the opposition if those, in case those people at least stay at home at the next uh, uh, election uh, the following year, or even go and vote for the opposition. And that's why I try to say that uh, the opposition might use this opportunity to make it evident that those who vote for Europe, uh, sorry, vote for Orban, would vote against uh, uh, Europe. And those who vote for us would vote for, for the membership of Hungary in the European Union. So that's, that's uh, another uh, uh, territory where uh, the opposition might uh, get uh, uh, into and use this opportunity since uh, everybody will remember this, this conflict. We are not so far from the elections uh, next year. Thanks. Um, thanks for that. Yes, uh, uh, Balaj, you're back, so you can ask your yes. question. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, have I told you that I hate Skype so much? <laughs> <laughs> OK, so my question is this. Um, there have been a few years since uh, we have experienced that uh, Fidesz uh, is uh, playing uh, the victim part in its relation uh, with the European Union and uh, all the claims that have been formulated, uh, negative claims uh, against Fidesz and its approach to the rule of law. Uh, so my question is, uh, why do you think that Fidesz didn't wait uh, for the People's Party to throw them out so they can pose again as victims of the big bad uh, European uh, institutions, uh, which would have been, of course, very useful uh, uh, in the next year's elections and posing as the, the brave people who face the European Union and uh, look what they have done to us. Thank you. Should I answer now directly? Yes, please. Okay. Yes. OK. Uh, very good question. Certainly, I don't know. You know what I can say. These are just hypotheses, and I don't have real internal information why Orban decided to leave and not wait to be kicked out. Maybe the number one reason is that he wanted to show that he's very strong and he makes decisions, not anyone else. That may be true. Uh, maybe uh, he can play with both what you mentioned to be the victim. It's still true that uh, all the Westerners uh, uh, are attacking us and there is a war between uh, the liberal minded uh, 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 West and the traditional and the representatives of traditional values that is Fidesz. Uh, he can still play with it. but. I, I have also another idea that it's it's a process, you know, it's a psychological process. What Orban did yesterday, he might have not done two years ago, but now he's fed up. He's fed up with the mainstream European politicians. Uh, I think he believes that he is an extraordinary talented politician, whilst all these others in the EPP, including Manfred Weber, or previously Joseph Dorn. These are sort of amateurs, and they should not tell him what to do. He won three elections uh, since 2010 in a row, and he might win another one. He's a very important person, the longest uh, 
blasting prime minister after Angela Merkel at European level. So do these people want to tell him what to do in politics? So it's unacceptable. So I think it's mostly a psychological outcome of this long conflict that he, as a sort of revolutionary-minded person, decided to leave them and not to allow them to kick him out. It's not only because of political communication, it's also because his own humiliation and feeling that he is much more superior to the others. So I make decisions, not these amateurs, but I don't know, it's just a hypothesis. Thanks, Istvan. Um, Alex, in spite of muting the microphones, you, you're welcome to ask your question. Alex, what's happened? Oh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, hello, thank you. Alex Follody, British freelance, your accidental saboteur. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, Ishran, isn't there a, a possibility that what happened yesterday doesn't weaken Orban, um, that it, um, it, it is an example of him having the best of both worlds because he has left behind in the EPP group his satellite parties, KDNP and RMDS, so he has spies inside the camp and he can put his um, people into committee positions and so on on the EPP mandate. Um, and he's also got a lever over the EPP leadership because they're scared that he might take with him um, into a new grouping, not only the ethnic Hungarian parties, but also his closely allied um, uh, 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 parties from Slovenia, from Bulgaria and from Croatia. Um, so, uh, in fact, he, isn't he in a position where he can attack the EPP from in, from outside while also having an uh, internal lead, levers on its leadership? I, isn't this the best of both worlds for him? Yeah. Well, uh, certainly there is a risk that uh, many might follow him leaving the EPP, but I don't, I think not too many. Some members of the uh, Hungarian Romanian party might leave, maybe the Slovenians, uh, but I'm not sure at all. Uh, and, and the other idea is what you also mentioned, leaving, not leaving, but staying, and having good contacts uh, with Orban. Actually, what Orban already had good contacts with Kaczynski and, uh, and uh, the Conservative and Reform Party inside the European Parliament. So to follow somehow a double strategy, and there might be some spies inside uh, the EPP. But I wouldn't say that's a sort of brave new word for, for Orban. I think all the other arguments are more important that actually this this was a defeat for him. Uh, even if there is one Hungarian member of the European Parliament who is seemingly a Christian Democrat and would stay in the EPP's group, I'm sure that this guy would not be able to influence 160, 180 MEPs, uh, maybe not a very important politician at all. So. Uh, and as for the Slovenians and many others, it's again the same question as usually. Should we cooperate with Orban and uh, making, uh, creating enemies for ourselves now inside the EPP and at European level? This is the same dilemma what uh, some prime ministers or governments face when they have some sympathies to or, or uh, good feelings towards Orban's uh, illiberal ideas. But when they have to make decisions, they have to have in mind what Germany, France, or, or other big states and uh, or not so big uh, member states have in mind the traditional West when they want to have support and uh, money coming from the EU. And they mostly voted in favor of the second option to have good relationship with, uh, with the mainstream political elite in the EU. When we talk about uh, Bulgaria, Slovenia, uh, other members, Croatia, uh, uh, the Czechs, the Slovaks, 
even when they had a more or less populist government uh, at home, they were hesitant to be the simple supporters of Orban. So I think this logic is more important at the moment. But in case the populist international or its group inside the European Parliament becomes stronger and more influential, then these uh, politicians and parties might consider their positions again. But I think in the short run, at least maybe until the next European elections, Orban's positions have weakened at European level. And as we discussed, it has weakened at Hungarian level as well. Thank you. Thanks, Istvan. Um, I haven't seen any other questions. Have, has anyone got one? Sorry if I've missed um, a signal. Um, otherwise, uh, I, I, I would like to follow up on um, on Mr. Weber. I, I gather he's he, he almost sounds conciliatory and sorry, and he he wants to speak to uh, Victor Orban. Um, do you think there's any way that they that he's trying to actually bring them back in and reverse the decision? Or even if he does try, would would uh, Victor actually in any way change his mind? I, I doubt that there is a way back. I think the conflict is too deep, too long. Uh, and there are so many inside the European People's Party who would be really, uh, you know, not only surprised, but outraged uh, after what happened in the in the last year. So we just talked about some politicians and parties inside the EPP who or which parties might actually have some second feelings towards Orban. But I think for the majority, it, the feeling is enough was enough. And I think that actually Manfred Weber belongs to, to those politicians as well. So why he was so soft yesterday, I don't know. Maybe he simply meant that he still wants to have a sort of diplomatic good relationship with Fidesz, and maybe he believes or hopes that Orban would not join uh, Salvini the next day. Uh, I don't know what he really meant by being a little bit uh, too soft, uh, according to my, my feelings. But uh, uh, what what I uh, what I think that what is uh, mo what is more surprising a little bit why the Austrian uh, delegation, except its leader Karas, uh, did vote in favor of uh, Orban, did not support the modification of the of the rules and procedures, uh, and I don't know again what play Sebastian Kurz is playing at the moment. Actually, he. He was uh, quite uh, deliberate during the debate uh, on the Sargentini report when he supported the idea uh, to approve the Sargentini report, which meant that he was against Orban and Fidesz just two years ago. So I don't understand really what's going on in Austria or inside the Austrian party. Maybe it's not so important anymore. And I hope it was just, again, a one-day um, a strange reaction by Manfred Weber, and it won't have any influence on the story what we discussed so long. Yeah, thank you. Alex, you've got another one coming back? Um, yes, talking about the, um, the, the possibility, just to sort of challenge a little bit, the possibility of rapprochement. Um, uh, uh, yesterday, technically, Fidesz uh, left the EPP group in the parliament, um, it hasn't so far signalled uh, its withdrawal from the European People's Party itself, from the party structures. Um, uh, do, do, um, do, you, do you think that that leaves uh, or indicates that options are being left open? Well, again, I, I don't know. Orban still has time to think about it. Uh, but... Uh, Anyway, I think that membership inside the EPP as a party, as I said at the beginning, is much less important, and it's much less salient and much less important. Uh, on the other hand, Donald Tusk, the president of the EPP as a party, uh, has become uh, 
a very strong uh, enemy in the eyes of Orban, and he wants to kick out Fidesz, and he tried to do so in recent years. Now, he has a strong argument that uh, Fidesz does not belong to the EPP group anymore. Why should it belong to the EPP as a party? But I don't know what, how the internal uh, uh, relationship or, or, or uh, power fights look like uh, inside the EPP as a party. And there might be some more supporters uh, of Fidesz uh, having some political parties from Southeastern uh, Europe. Uh, which parties uh, are allies to to Orban. So maybe it's not so easy to kick Orban out. Whether Orban decides to leave, I think it depends how his negotiations go on with the um, Conservative and Reform Party or moreover with, with parties on the very right, Salvini and others. And at one point, he might think that there is no return and he would join uh, the populist and create the populist international. But he still has a sort of room of maneuver. I agree that it might not happen tomorrow. It might happen in, in a couple of months. On the other hand, as I said, Orban is a revolutionary and he might like to make the first step uh, as a surprise. And we might be surprised in a couple of months how fast events uh, develop and uh, and he might decide to leave the EPP as a party in case it has no sense or no advantage for him uh, anymore. Feels a bit like getting divorced and carrying on sleeping together, though, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, um, <clears throat> uh, anybody uh, got any questions there? Or um, I, I was I was going to ask Istvan that. Um, I mean, in the V4 and even in Slovenia and all around, they'll be they'll be taking notice of this. And. It strikes me it will send some shivers down some spines. Um, that Orban has been, you know, even a little bit like in a parallel situation to what, what my earlier question was about some more genuine conservative Fidesz members may get shocked. Um, I just wonder, in fact, if this will have impacts on the apparent allies of um, of Orban in, in the V4, Slovenia and Croatia, in fact, and weaken those parties. Uh, what, what do you think to that idea? I, maybe I'm wrong. Well, I think that uh, without having too much information, but by my hypothesis, again, is that inside uh, the Croatian Conservative Party or the Slovenian Party, this development might strengthen those who argue that we should not follow the Orbanian way because then we are out of the mainstream and that's not in our interest. And uh, uh, as far as I know, inside uh, the Croatian uh, uh, Conservative Party, there are two lines. One is uh, in maybe the smaller one, which uh, much less influential one, which is in favor of urbanism. And uh, this is good news that, that the bigger mainstream political line uh, under Prime Minister uh, is, is, uh, is much more pro-European. And I think that this development will help him to keep this political line uh, in the Croatian party safer. And also it's a sort of message for, for other parties all over on, uh, in Southeastern Europe, on the Balkans, that it's a dangerous game to follow Orban's uh, route because it's not acceptable for the mainstream at European level. Moreover, if I may, I would add that regarding the transatlantic relationship following the victory of Joe Biden last year, and having in mind the, the idea that he wants to have a, a summit or a summit of de democracies uh, sooner or later, and who will be invited to this summit. Now, it's maybe much more easier to say that uh, Hungary, the Hungarian government, does not belong to these traditional democracies anymore, just following uh, many 
arguments uh, or 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 the the how the Freedom House, for example, uh, evaluate uh, the situation in Hungary, and uh, it might be easier for the United States not to invite Hungary to such a conference uh, anymore, a summit of democracies. And it might be, again, a message to the other political groups and governments in the region that they have to uh, follow the general rules of liberal democracy, rule of law, constitutional checks and balances, and so on. All the values which are so important now on both sides of the Atlantic at the moment. So in that context, again, I think that what happened yesterday was a positive development, uh, not only for, for the EU and for Hungary, but globally as well. Since Orban became such a, a famous or infamous person in the international media, that what happened is really not just a Hungarian affair at all. Right, yes, thank you. Um, we can, uh, we've still got 10 minutes, nine minutes, if anyone's got any questions. Oh, hello, sorry, Alex again, I, I have one. Um, uh, Ishtan, you, you mentioned that the Austrian Conservatives surprised everyone by voting against um, Fidesz's expulsion by backing up Fidesz. Um, sorry that I, 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 if I've missed anything that you said earlier, but um, uh, because I joined later, uh, but do we know what other um, parties stood behind Orban in the uh, vote yesterday, apart from his satellites? Um, so what other national parties uh, voted against Fidesz's suspension or expulsion? Or, or rather the change in rules that would have allowed it? Yeah, what, what I read uh, in, in the Politico report, that these were the Hungarians themselves, uh, well, that's 11 or 12 members, and uh, uh, the Austrians, most of the Austrians, and the Slovenians. And that's all. Maybe there were some others, uh, because uh, maybe the vote was not uh, you know, open, but everybody talked about it to the journalists later on. So that's what I've read, that uh, these, these are the three groups. And this is a huge majority, 80-some percent of the others who voted in favor of the uh, of the new rules and procedures, but everybody knew, in spite of some declaration, declarations, that this is more or less about Fidesz. It's not only a change of status, a bureaucratic step. And in the debate before the vote, uh, Orban's message was seen by many as a sort of uh, uh, ultimate uh, reasoning by Fidesz, a pressure on them, which they did not like. So I think what happened uh, was finally that the, most of the members in the EPP group decided what I said before, that enough is enough. We don't uh, follow Orban's rules and logic and we change the procedures and, uh, it, and then or Orban and Fidesz might leave. And we will feel a sort of relief that this uh, long fight is over. And I think there was only a very small minority inside the EPP which disagreed with this feeling. Thank you. Um, a subject which we've not, no one else has got any questions, have they? Uh, please put your hands up. But a subject which hasn't come up, um, uh, moving away from pure politics a little bit. Uh, I don't know if this is a fair one for you, Istvan, but um, you know, you're a German CEO mulling a 50 million euro investment in with a short list of Hungary, Romania, Serbia, Macedonia, and you get this news this morning or yesterday. Do you think it will shake Hungary's investment um, profile and confidence? Well, I, I don't think so that, um, you know, foreign investment will decrease because what happened yesterday. Uh, in case uh, the business people still think that the business environment is, uh, is acceptable and the political situation is not fragile, uh, they might not care so much about uh, rule of law and uh, 
liberal democracy. I think there are differences. Maybe for some business people and some companies, this is more important. And, and maybe sometimes they are ready to protest uh, or express their own views uh, about multiculturalism or gender, gender issues uh, like uh, IKEA or even some German companies. But in general, I, th I think this is not the number one aspect uh, or, or motivation uh, for, for business people what to do next. What I think is more important uh, that uh, but I try to say that politics and the logic of business investment, that's not the same. And, uh, uh, you know, business people might make uh, good investments in, in real, really authoritarian countries as well. But the conflict might be bigger sooner or later in an EU member state in case uh, the governments, their own governments have bad relationship with a neighboring other EU member state. And that's more or less the case now between Germany and, uh, and Hungary. But we will see the political play field is still, you know, there. And we have a new leader of the German uh, Christian Democratic Union. And, uh, and we will have a new prime minister of Germany soon. And politics will depend on that uh, change uh, much more. And then business might have its own room of maneuver, uh, even if uh, the political relations become more tense. We will see. So shortly, I think there is no such a risk that investment is not coming to Hungary. Only if European uh, rules like uh, the new one, what was expected, accepted in December, the rule of law conditionality mechanism might create a new environment for business. And uh, there will be a lack of trust among business people that Hungary is not a safe place anymore. That might change the situation a lot, I guess. Right. Yeah. Yes, that's a good thought. Uh, we're coming up to one hour and um, We've had a lot of insights from you, Istvan. Has anybody got a final question before um, I say uh, great thanks to you for um, for stepping in so quickly and making yourself available today, Istvan? It's um, great uh, to hear your your views and um, and uh, yeah, the analysis. It, it's it's uh, been a great help. So thanks, everybody. Thank you, Istvan, and we hope we can see you again another time. We yeah. hope we haven't worn you out. <laughs> it was and, my pleasure. Yeah. And tomorrow, um, of course, we have uh, Reverend uh, Gabor Ivani. So please, um, uh, everybody, um, you're welcome to that. Uh, I did. I, w I asked Esther to send out an email. She may have done it, um, asking her to asking everybody to.